Yes, welcome <coughs> to this uh, seminar on laws and damage. A great pleasure to see you. Um, I can just say that, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, my name is Lars Engberg Petersen. I'm a senior researcher here at DIES and will try to guide us through the next one and a half hours. Um, it is a little bit complicated with the technology, so um, so please bear with us. But the program is pretty uh, dense, so, so um, I hope that we can uh, go straight into the matter, and um, I will not say much here at, as a beginning. Just uh, say welcome and thank you very much for coming. Great that you are here. This uh, seminar is, um, of course, uh, fairly uh, relevant right now up to the COP27, uh, and, and also given that uh, we have just uh, undertaken a study of laws and damage uh, commissioned by the Nordic Council of Ministers, um, and and uh, the product of, of that study will come out very soon, both a report and a, a, a policy brief, and you will be able to find it on, on um, uh, DSIS website uh, one of the coming weeks. So uh, this is the basis for, for this particular seminar. Um, and uh, what you will hear now is also very much based on, on the work um, in, um, with this study. So uh, we have first uh, a couple of cases that will be presented to you. Then we have um, the conclusions of the study being presented. Then we have some considerations about where do we go from here. And finally, we have a session a panel discussion um, where uh, you will have a chance to take up issues you would like, uh, post questions and so on. Uh, but we should have uh, connections to Ghana and to Canada uh, here, so, so um, we can hear about cases from, from these places. So first we will go to, um, to Ghana and hear about loss and damage and climate migration in northern Ghana. And um, presented by uh, Francis Jaraura who is a human geographer and a lecturer at the Dombo University for Business and Integrated Development Studies in Ghana. I hope, Francis, that you are with us, and the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, morning. As mentioned, um, I am Francis uh, Jaraura, um, and I'm happy to share with you uh, the case from Upper West in Northern Ghana. Um, so Northern Ghana is basically um, encompassed by the savannah, which is a dry zone. And uh, in this area, uh, livelihoods are mainly based on agriculture, with about 95% of the people uh, farming and also uh, rearing all kinds of animals, good cattle, uh, sheep, just about five in number. Uh, per average per household. And the uh, rainfall pattern is a single maximum, and that means that it's only one rainy season in a year. So this also means so much risk for many farmers because everything is concentrated in one season. If you make the losses, that's so much. You have no opportunity with very little irrigation of about 1%, and uh, which is mostly informal irrigation schemes. Um, so, what we have uh, observed with uh, our studies in northern uh, Ghana, particularly the Upper West region, is that uh, since 1970, the average temperatures have increased of about uh, one degree Celsius. So, if we look at the mean monthly maximum temperature, we have found that uh, maximum temperatures have increased for all the months, uh, from January to December during the last two decades particularly. So this means uh, uh, some impacts for mostly the crop farmers. So it also means that uh, uh, some of the crops will now have a bit difficulty and farmers also have difficulties deciding when to really plant their crops. So when we look at the rainfall trends, what we have also found is that uh, the significant deviation um, of annual rainfall values from the long-term mean. So what we see is that there's an extended period of rainfall deficit. And uh, as you can see, the 1980s to 1990 particularly uh, had seen so much droughts 
and also rainfall deficits. Of course, this was across the entire Africa. Uh, so we also see that uh, between the period 2000 to 2010, there are a couple of uh, uh, periods that uh, we experienced rainfall de deficits. Then we also see rainfall distribution from WAF from the year 2010 have mainly been below the long-term average. Uh, this is not good, and it actually means a reduction in the total rainfall over the period. Um, there have been a lot of economic losses to climate change and variability in the Upper West Ghana. And uh, this is against the background of high levels of poverty, uh, persistent poverty as well. So we see that uh, this is the poorest region in the country. Uh, floods, notably in 2007, 2011, 2017, and 2021, have uh, wrought havoc on crops and uh, livestock, so much that people had to leave their households to migrate to southern Ghana to work and make some income. So houses were also uh, uh, brought down by these floods, bridges collapse, roads and markets as well. And also this uh, Upper West region borders Burkina Faso and it's a major trade link. So for one month, at least last year, there was no trade link between Burkina Faso and Ghana. And the people of Upper West really lost a lot because there's a lot of uh, middlemen and other uh, activities that take place. Uh, droughts, of course, have also caused so much damage to crops and animals, and uh, short spells have become much more dangerous than actually droughts because droughts have become less intense and the uh, dry spells have become more frequent. Uh, so this has actually uh, increased the threats to food insecurity and also farming. But uh, Climate change and variability in this region have not only brought economic losses also, but also non-economic losses. Uh, these have often seen less attention though. So we see loss of biodiversity, um, uh, which uh, because some crops no longer do very well under uh, changing climate conditions, uh, maize, uh, some varieties of granules, and also some natural vegetation, the shea tree and the dawadawa, which are uh, fruits for the people, but also uh, they harvest them for uh, uh, the market. We also have seen gradual loss of uh, indigenous varieties, of course, uh, not only because the climate no longer supports them that much, but also because people have to adapt to the changes in climate. So they adopt new varieties. And when you adopt new varieties, then there are fewer people growing the traditional varieties. But when you don't grow these traditional varieties, uh, you lose some of your cultural ways of living because now some of the uh, indigenous people don't have the crops needed for their sacrifices, for their festivals, and uh, also to make the food that they have always cherished for much long. So some older people are really in trouble because they are not happy with the new varieties. Then of course, when flooding occurred, uh, almost every year we have flooding, and then um, some communities have to relocate. Some have relocated permanently on advice of the government. Others have been adamant. So some have actually lost their uh, social capital as they move away from their neighbors and everyone spreads across. And this is uh, almost impossible to quantify their psychological damage and also the loss of uh, networks. Then uh, people have migrated uh, uh, in response to some of the sudden flooding events, but also to slow onset events as well. So distress migration, is now becoming much more common than first. And when these people migrate, they tend to engage in a lot of hazardous activities in order to generate income and food. So it also then opens them up to exploitative labor uh, regimes in the southern Ghana, but also across the border in Burkina Faso, where there's growing vegetable farms. So um, I've tried to tell the small story of Upper West uh, in a few words. Um, so what I have been saying is about changes, uh, increase in temperature and also increasing climate variability. And of course, this means a lot for a population that's highly dependent on rainfall with little irrigation, as low as 1% irrigation. So the economic losses, of course, are widely known 
but the non-economic losses are little known and not given much attention. And I think this is where researchers could do much better with policy makers. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Can we? <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis, for making this yeah. concrete. Um, hope you will be around for the panel uh, discussion in a, in a moment. Uh, now we turn to Canada uh, and a presentation on losses and responses across human and natural systems in indigenous communities, a Kanakapa Indian band uh, as a case study. And uh, here we have uh, Lilia Yamagulova and Patrick Mitchell. Uh, Lilia has a PhD in resilience planning and is the program director for the Preparing Our Home program that empowers indigenous youth leadership in community resilience. And Patrick, um, he is the former chief of Kanakaba Indian Band and is a very recognized leader on climate action in Canada. So good to have you here with us. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's a great honor to be joining you today from the Sinaix territories uh, here in Canada. So first, before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge the topic, the heavy topic that we're talking about today, um, losses and responses and impacts uh, of climate change. This is not a theoretical construct. It is not an academic concept. This is a living reality for many indigenous peoples around the world. I wanted to open the, today's presentation with this uh, painting by Nibin Prince from Matagami First Nation. When I look at this painting, I think about loss and grief, and I feel what the mothers feel around the world. But what she sees is rest and patience and beauty. What she sees is that we need to rest before the work ahead of us. And I think that's why it's so important to include different voices and the different perspectives that we bring on this topic. So I'm really grateful that today the lived experience is included on this panel as well. So thank you, Lily and the organizers. So when we look at Canada, Canada is warming on average twice as fast or as much as the world, the rest of the world. Um, so the Arctic is warm, uh, the warming at three times the rate. Uh, so we've already seen the 2% increase in Canada on, on average. And here is a drawing by uh, Cheyenne Cockerell in Selkirk, Manitoba. She was 16 when she drew this drawing. And you can see we added the environment and climate change uh, Canada graph to it. The wolf is angry and the wolf is scared because the impacts are real and they're happening. In Canada, the impacts are really disproportionately um, concentrated in indigenous communities. And in order to understand these impacts, it's really important to understand the colonial impacts of displacement and losses first. So it's really important to understand the intrinsic connections uh, that indigenous peoples have to, on traditional territories. It's really important to understand non-climatic social inequities, such as housing, emergency services, health, so on and so forth. And it's really important to understand individual, collective, and intergenerational impacts of displacement. So when we talk about specific impacts, how, does, how do they manifest? So indigenous communities, if you live in a First Nations community in Canada, you are 33 times more likely to be evacuated due to wildfire, 18 times more likely to be evacuated due to any disaster such as flooding or anything else, while fire fatalities at 10 times higher than Canadian average. And at this point, I will post, pass it on to my co-presenter, uh, Chief Patrick. Um, thank you, uh, Lily, and uh, thank you for this honor to share. So the Intlacamp Nation is in British Columbia, Canada, and our external nation boundaries are bisected by the 49th parallel. And so we show our geographical location uh, through this red polygon. And on the right, uh, my community itself, uh, based on a watershed model, has a, a tidal and rights or the ability to manage the land and resources within a smaller part of the red polygon. Uh, so this is called the traditional territory. Uh, my community's uh, uh, pronunciation is Kalkluktenmu, or the crossing place people, uh, and it means the people who live within the purple polygon. Next, please, Lily. Um, for 8,000 years, the resources, the land of resources at Kanakabar were managed for future generations. That's first and foremost what we did. There was a, there was a relationship of harmony and respect. You don't destroy, we're not parasites, you don't destroy the land that you live on. 
So it was so this relationship was based on somebody had to determine whether or not the land of resource could handle the ask so that there was something left over for future generations. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see I wrote a document called Memory Loss and Sorrow that really kind of captures the impacts of contact and change. Um, obviously, the story, the Canadian story about uh, the colonial practices on the Indigenous people has produced many of what of Lily has produced. We were never given a chance to adapt to colonial practices. And now we're facing the worst case scenarios brought about by climate change. Um, another document that uh, really uh, summarizes the impacts of colonial, colonialism on Indigenous people is the 1967 Lament for Confederation. Uh, and now it's, uh, well, we'll call it 2022. We're facing a global existential crisis. Next slide. Um, so sustainability in life. So common sense speaks to me what I was raised as by a child. What you do to the land or allow other dues, you do to yourself. Common sense, right? So if you live uh, an exploitive and extractive way, eventually you're going to run out of resources whether that is a mineral wealth, whether that is a timber wealth, whether it is a marine life. Um, and we've articulated uh, since contact that you can't keep living this way. Um, so the land produced everything we needed to live on the left, um, but the land also produces the resources. So the land gives you life and quality of life. And again, we're facing an ending of that. So what can we do next? Um, so the Kanakabar Indian Band, uh, basically by 1978, uh, became aware of this, this oppressive culture of life. I call it a culture of despair. And we said, to be frank, no, we're not going to live like this. 8,000 years, we lived sustainably in a good way. And so we began the otter's attack of reversing colonization. And we did it through community engagement and basically in the nicest possible way, telling Ottawa, Thanks, but no thanks, we've got this. So we worked as a community to reverse the adverse effects of colonization. Next slide. And ultimately, we've come up now with a community resiliency plan. So we, we reverse colonization, and now we have a plan to take on climate change. Lily showed an example uh, of a wolf. Um, when we were children, we were told the story about the wolf and the straw stick and brick houses and how the wolf used wind to blow the climate change is producing four wolves, extreme heat, extreme wind, extreme cold, and extreme wet. And they're not showing up one at a time every 10 years. It's happening with bright, uh, great frequency. On June 30th of 2021, my hometown reached 56 degrees Celsius and burnt down in less than 20 minutes. And I'm still living with that physical impact. But more importantly, 15 months later, not only am I, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, you here and here. And how do you survive a catastrophic impact? You do it together. Let's see what we got next. Lily. So the community resiliency plan basically sets out everything that we can do at Kanakabar to prepare for the extreme weather events the, the, the catastrophes that it causes, but also allows us to be resilient so we can shelter in place during an extreme weather event and be okay. Um, so we created this image as a tree. The foundations of our community are at the bottom. It grew the trunk that produces all the branches. So we now have in effect uh, seven planning areas with 120 projects, programs, and services that allow us to prepare. We can't eliminate the consequences, but we can mitigate them. So that's Kanakabar's plan for the next five years. Um, I don't know what everybody else's is, but we've established security, food security at Kanakabar and air, water, food, and shelter. Uh, we set up our own cell tower and we did it by the fruit of our own hands. Isn't that what we're all taught? You reap what you sow, right? We work hard to prepare. And we, we are greatly concerned because one of the, the effects of climate change is, and I use the analogy, and I'm over in Fredericton, New Brunswick right now at a national gathering, and there's over 500 First Nations here uh, working with the federal government to come up with climate change uh, programs that can be rolled out uh, soon. 
the the lady or no it wasn't even a lady or a man it was now a video that said put the mask on your face before you help others i can't help my neighbors if i'm in response mode and trust me i'm living in response mode and yeah i don't i don't wish what i'm living on in anybody so lily what do we got next so uh, Kanaka Bar, of course, has survived colonization. We're uniquely positioned to survive the next 100 years because we reestablished foundational management of land and resources. We have enough water for the next 100 years, not only for my community, but for our neighbours. We are growing enough food for our not but yet we're Canada's hotspot. We don't rely on the weather to produce uh, irrigation water. We are storing the water. So we're going to continue to work together where we've got weather stations, we're monitoring the weather, where we're sheltering in place during extreme weather events and being resilient, we're able to come out and of course, look after our families and our neighbours during times of crisis. Thank you very much, Chief Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you, Lily and Patrick. Uh, very good to get these concrete um, yeah, pictures of, of what we are actually talking about, but also a little bit of hope here with a plan for how to address the issues. Now we continue to next point on the agenda, namely uh, Lily, who will uh, present the conclusions of the study. Um, Lily um, is a researcher here at DIES and has coordinated uh, the study and is in charge of that. So please, Lily. All right, thanks very much. So good to see all of you here. And I want to say, uh, to start with, thank you very much to Francis, to Lilia, and to Chief Patrick. I think it's often useful um, when you're looking at something as, uh, as broad as loss and damage, uh, and we're looking at it also at a global policy level, to start with some lived experiences, to understand how these things are experienced in practice, as that is in you know, also the policy sphere, what we're trying to respond to. So I think that's always a good way to start, and thank you very much. We're trying to get my PowerPoint online. In the meantime, yes, my name is Lily Lindegaard. I'm a researcher here at DIES, and I've been coordinating this study. And today I have the pleasure of sharing our conclusions with you. Uh, as Lars said previously, the report is on the way. And so we hope to share that with all of you soon. Um, just to uh, go a bit into the PowerPoint as well, I would like to say that in general through this process with the report and the study as a whole we've been trying to bridge policy research and practice as any of you working with loss and damage know it is it's a, extremely broad um, it covers a lot of things and and i think that comes out very clearly in what we've just heard from from uh, these different contexts so any uh, <laughs> any effort to assess these across these three areas is going to be very difficult. Um, but we've tried to be as a two approach it constructively. And the way that we've done that is we've started with a point of departure in the Paris Agreement. We've recognized the importance of addressing loss and damage, but also of averting and minimizing. So these three things together. So that's our point of departure on kind of the policy side, what it is that we've recognized is important to do. And then from there, we go to the science and also the, the practice on the ground. Where are we? What is the status? And we've been very lucky to get the most recent IPCC report this year. And in the most recent report, which covers the last basically seven years of research on this topic, we can see that we're in a place with widespread adverse effects and related losses and damages. So it's coming out very clearly that this is something that we're seeing very concretely on the ground to an extent that we had not anticipated. And I think that that's the main message. I would very much like to get the PowerPoint up and hopefully it's on the way. Um, but the way that we've gone about it in the report is that we start with looking at the development of loss and damage as a policy sphere. So we look from science to policy, how this has developed over time and where we are right now. 
From there, we go into research and practice, and we look at four different areas. Um, we look at sudden and slow onset events um, across human and natural systems, looking at economic and non-economic losses, and also, um, where are we on the fourth risk, producing and reducing risk. And then, as many of you will know, then another major topic within loss and damage is also human mobility, and that comes out across these three dimensions four dimensions, sorry. From there, then we go back to the policy side and we say, what is going on in the UNFCCC processes? And so we look at three main policy areas within that that are extremely relevant right now in terms of loss and damage. And one is on finance arrangements, looking at specifically the Glasgow Dialogue. Then we're looking at the Santiago Network and the work around operationalizing that that's going on right now. And then finally, we look at the governance of the Warsaw International Mechanism, which is um, the only body in the UNFCCC that's explicitly mandated to work with loss and damage in particular. So those are, that's the basis on which we come forward to the conclusions, which I'm about to present in the PowerPoint, which I'm sure is on its way. Yeah. <laughs> any, uh, any progress here? Great. I, of course, didn't print this um, because of all the places I expected technical difficulties today, this is not one of them. Um, but, uh, but we'll uh, go ahead and, and get started without a backup PowerPoint. All right, so the first main conclusion of the report is that there's a greater need to, um, and actually uh, not having the PowerPoint, I, wanted, I want to actually roll back a minute because before we get to the conclusions, um, I want to say a little bit more about what it is we're seeing in the science because I think that's an important basis for this. So, you know, the IPCC, we found out that we're having widespre widespread adverse impacts of climate change and related losses and damages, that's very clear. Um, we know that these have occurred at lower levels of warming than we previously anticipated. So these are happening more quickly than we thought. We know also that we're on track um, from the latest UNEP gap report towards up to 2.7 degrees of warming. There's about a 50-50 chance within the next couple of decades that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees. We know already now that we have irreversible consequences of climate change and every um, s small warming more over what we are at today means a more limited um, set of adaptation options. Um, the kinds of harm that we're seeing, because when you look at the definition of lo loss and damage, it's harm from kind of felt and future changes, so, so current impacts, harm from current impacts, and future risk. So we're looking at both. What kinds of harm that entails, some of the things, woo, good news. We can, yeah, thank you. One of the things that, I mean, some of the things that we're already seeing now, we're seeing loss of entire ecosystems, specialized ecosystems, but loss of entire ecosystems. We're seeing mass extinction events, loss of biodiversity. We're seeing increased morbidity, mortality, food insecurity, um, malnutrition, and the list goes on. So, I mean, that's just to give a status of where it is we are now and what the basis for some of these discussions are if we're taking our point of departure in the current um, state of loss and damage on the ground. So, the Paris Agreement, <laughs> point of departure, widespread spread pervasive impacts, what we're seeing um, on the ground, and the point of all of this is to look at the gaps and find ways forward. Where are we exactly? That's some of what I've just gone through. The extent and magnitude is greater than previously assessed. Climate impacts uh, risks are appearing um, at lower levels than previously predicted. And we're on track towards 2.7, up to 2.7. And it's important to note, this, dis this is despite extensive mitigation and adaptation action. So we're already seeing extreme impacts. They're very extensive. They're, in some cases, extremely severe. And this is just by all of our current action. Okay. So this is just the rundown of the approach and uh, the content of the report that I gave previously. And through that, we've come to these gaps and ways forward. Great. So the first gap, policy address as a attention to addressing losses and damages. And that's merely as a, well, I'll go through these in detail in a moment. Let's go through them all first. 
further development of knowledge of un or under-addressed losses and damages that came out a bit in our cases, that there's some areas that we just haven't had so much focus until now, um, or at least in comparison to, to other areas, we'll get to that. Designing approaches and modalities to respond to these losses and damages, looking at finance particularly, getting the Santiago network up and running, clarity on governance arrangements to support action, and coordination and institutionalization across sectors, and finally, some effort to depoliticize, perhaps. So we'll go through these quickly. Policy attention to addressing losses and damages. So efforts to date under the UNFCCC, they focus very understandably on mitigation and adaptation. Now, we're looking at this, and if we're looking at that and at the same time having recognized the importance of averting, minimizing, and addressing, then we need more attention to addressing. And here I'm referring to those resi residual losses and damages that are beyond the limits of adaptation. So specifically to those, because as we've seen from the science, as we hear from the cases presented today as well, that also are two of actually four cases in the report, there are extensive losses and damages that are beyond the limits of adaptation, simply because we have not been able to, or simply have not <laughs> uh, mitigated or adapted enough. Gap two, we get it all. Um, further development of knowledge of un- or under-addressed losses and damages. And this is particularly certain aspects of losses and damages, slow onset, non-economic, uh, and existential losses. And I'll say also losses in general. There's um, you can differentiate between losses and damages. Damages is something that um, that is reparable. Losses, some are kind of trying to delineate as something that is not. Um, and that process of delineation in a way is just as, as uh, to kind of clarify what it is we're talking about and how we can address these. So realities on the ground in many of these areas in particular have outpaced our projections in our knowledge. To understand these better, we need inclusive knowledge production processes um, with diverse sources and forms of knowledge. Because I think, I mean, in a lot of areas, loss and damage very much. Um, to understand what loss and damage is to a specific place and community requires, of course, inclusive processes that also incorporate their knowledge. At the same time, you have a lot of actors that have been producing knowledge on some of these topics. So we need processes that can integrate these. Tools to recognize and assess losses and damages in a lot of places where things are going unaddressed because they're simply not assessed. We don't have the processes in place in a lot of areas that are most vulnerable to loss and damage, and that's particularly in the global south, simply don't have the processes to recognize them. There are a lot of existing efforts, so we also need knowledge on what is there, to what extent it's able to address particular kinds of losses and damages, what gaps are still there, and so on. And then also attribution of causal linkages between emissions and impacts, because that can give us a better understanding of the relationship between anthropogenic climate change and particular impacts and losses and damage. They can be useful both as at a policy level, uh, but also in terms of responding to these on the ground. Designing approaches and modalities to respond to losses and damages, because these can be unprecedented in their nature or their scope. And I think that's something that comes out clearly in the IPCC report. We thought we had more time. You know, these things are happening more quickly than we anticipated. They're happening at a scope that we had not anticipated. And in their nature, they're perhaps different than many of the things that we have responded to through development efforts, through adaptation efforts, disaster risk reduction, humanitarian efforts. We also need attention to governance and decision-making processes, because who is it that decides, in a particular context, what loss and damage is, what loss and damages should be responded to, and how? Transformative approaches and architectures to support these. We know that incremental adaptation can actually limit the options for transformative change. 
And transformative change, the IPCC describes as critical to um, going beyond the limits to adaptation. So if you say you have a threshold of what's possible to adapt to, Transfi transformational approaches can get us beyond that threshold. But by doing small incremental changes, we can sometimes put ourselves on a pathway um, that limits ourselves and, and doesn't support later transformational change. But do we have the architecture and modalities to support transformational change? Related finance and technical assistance. I think that speaks for itself. Finance. So current funding gaps <coughs> are limiting responses to losses and damages. We can util utilize existing funds. Um, there's a lot of discussion about these different options, adaptation fund, GCF, perhaps a dedicated window. There's also the suggestion of a new loss and damage financial mechanism. Um, talk of scaling up humanitarian and disaster and development support. Um, and then also innovative sources of finance, because many of these things, they require voluntary contributions our development assistance, um, finance, climate finance through the UN triple, triple C. And just because there are more losses and damages occurring does not necessarily mean that more money will be on the table. We know we're already struggling to meet the $100 billion a year. Um, and so if the need is growing, where is that money coming from? And that has prompted discussions of inno innovative sources of finance. A fit for purpose Santiago network. So the uh, process of operationalizing the Santiago network is ongoing. And the uh, Santiago network is to offer technical assistance to developing countries in terms of loss and damage. Um, and it specifically enhance action and support to loss and damage, including finance, technology, and, and capacity building. And the important thing through this process will be that it's, a, you know, the, the manner in which it's designed is designed with an eye to addressing the needs of developing countries. Um, what we need from here is consensus on the structure and the governance of it, and then clarity on the finance of how it, it, this particular network will be financed. Okay, clarity on the governance arrangements of the WIM. So we talked a bit about the WIM before, but to fulfill its mandate, it could be useful to have clarity on the governance dimensions of it. There are questions of, is it solely governed under the Paris Agreement, or is it governed both under the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC? And that difference is a change in mandate, in a way. So the mandate is dependent on, on where it kind of falls within these. And whatever is decided going forward, we'll need an eye to, uh, to the technical needs. And perhaps, and this is a suggestion, to move forward on this, it might be useful to separate this from discussions of finance, because that can, it is a very difficult discussion. And possibly focus negotiating efforts in the meantime on topics such as finance or the Santiago network, because if we're trying to move forward across areas, that could also be very difficult and kind of divert um, negotiating efforts and attention. Coordination and institutionalization across actors and sectors. So we need to align efforts. There are a lot of different actors that find themselves suddenly working within a field called loss and damage. Um, so we have efforts across the board and some of the kind of uh, areas of intervention I mentioned before. At the same time, we have processes going on at the international level in the UNFCCC and otherwise. But these need to be linked, obviously, to other levels, to national levels, to subnational levels. So we need to be aligning across actors and areas of intervention. But in terms of in-country mechanisms, we'll also need to be looking at national level and subnational level linkages between all of these and, and inclusion. Because as we know from loss and damage, to understand what loss and damage is for a particular place in a particular community, you need to have an understanding of what's going on exactly there. And then all of this together linked to the UNFCCC. And, and this is something that comes up in a lot of these um, discussions at a high political level uh, or policy level. You know, how is it that you're linking to what's going on on the ground? This, as well with loss and damage, is a critical need. So something that needs to be thought into our approach going forward, as we're very aware, many of us. Depoliticizing loss and damage liberations. Yeah, so to support progress on substantive issues, it would be very useful, if possible, to depoliticize some of these discussions because they 
have become extremely political. And this is not to, you know, just have wishful thinking. And at the same time, it's of course important that diverse perspectives and diverging perspectives can be accommodated and, and um, included in, in deliberations. At the same time, it could be useful to take a scientific needs-based framing um, in order to depoliticize some of these things. It may be useful, as I mentioned before, to kind of de-link some of these processes. So that would be, you know, processes uh, from governance um, of the WIM, the Santiago Network and its operationalization, and the financial arrangements. Are we making, are we, if we're able to de-link some of these from each other, we might be able to make progress maybe not across the board at the same time, but maybe on particular issues so we can see some ways forward. So I'll leave you with this, um, these two things, the gaps, but hopefully also some ways forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lili. Uh, excellent contribution without uh, PowerPoints, but also with PowerPoints. That was a great help, thanks. Now we turn to uh, some critical considerations on the way forward. Um, and for that purpose, we have the pleasure of uh, having the presence of Emily Boyd, uh, professor um, in sustainability studies at Lund University and a leading uh, voice in loss and damage research. Please. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? I think I've. I think you are on. I'm on? Yes, great. Thank you so much. Perfect. See if I can pull up my uh, presentation here. Um. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. I can see it, even if you can't. <laughs> so at least, yay. There we go. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, to have the opportunity to comment uh, on the report, but also just spark open a, a discussion here amongst all of you today, hopefully. I just wanted to have a show of hands of people in the room who uh, actively work on loss and damage or have heard of loss and damage. Okay, so quite a few. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm Emily Boyd. Uh, I'm uh, from across the bridge. I uh, just came over for the day. Uh, I've got a couple of colleagues here as well who would love to meet some of you later on as well. So I'm going to provide some sor short reflections broadly on the report uh, and also invite you all in to join in discussion. Um, I'm going to give a short uh, overview on sort of where I see this report fitting in terms of the timing and then talk a bit about, uh, I'm going to talk around three considerations because I have a very short time, there's a lot in the report that I could talk about but I'm going to just focus on three considerations around policy, practice and research and provide a few concluding remarks at the end. So. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this picture, but it's one of the pictures from this summer uh, in Europe. It's from uh, Italy, I believe. So the timing of this report uh, is obviously situated with an increased awareness globally about the effects uh, of climate change and the real impacts in terms of the scale and frequency, particularly of extreme events that we're seeing globally. And one of the things that the report points out here uh, or situates the need for this report is that losses and damages are increasingly uh, experienced and observed globally. So this is an important point, it might seem obvious uh, to you, but at the same time, it's something that scientists have predicted for a long time, but we're starting to see quite rapidly now the effects uh, of, of climate change. So. In the end of July, for example, 44% of Europe experienced, uh, experienced drought warnings and um, it was so hot that hundreds of Europeans actually lost their lives uh, during, this, during this time. And what we know is that extreme events such as heat waves or forest fires or hurricanes, um, they have severe consequences. Uh, and particularly for the most vulnerable groups in society who experience losses and damages, as we've heard previously from the speakers here this morning, um, this afternoon, 
uh, from Francis, Lily, and Patrick. So uh, these are real lived experiences uh, that are being felt. And what's interesting now is this is presumably no longer controversial or new to many of you here. Okay. So turning then to the report, situating it then within the context, the sort of three three points that uh, I thought were overarching in addition to these gaps that were just pointed out here previously, that um, despite the acknowledgement of the importance of averting, minimizing and addressing loss and damage uh, associated with the adverse effects of climate change, still we see very divergent views within the UNFCC. Okay, that's one of the things the report points out and the slow policy process around this. So we have, you know, visible evidence of what's happening, but still very slow policy responses and processes. Um, and what the report does, it links us then to say, well, this has therefore limited action in practice. Okay. So I think whilst it's something that we might need to unpack also in discussion, um, the extent to which the policy process at the global level is actually the driver of actions to loss and damage, or whether the actions on loss and damage are happening out there already in other spheres, and that maybe is where actions or responses will come about rather than within the UNFCCC. It's a little bit controversial maybe to say that. I don't know if any negotiators are here today, but I think it's a real, it's a real reality, both what we see also in terms of societies mobilizing, but also in terms of what we see in the research. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contestation around where effectiveness of responses are gonna come from uh, in governing climate change. Okay, so that's one point. Um, another one that the report focuses on is, it does state that, um, that actions to avert and minimize and address loss and damage are well underway, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation. So it makes that point. Uh, so we could talk about that, but I will make, I'll come to that in a minute to, to discuss whether we see sufficient action on adaptation and mitigation and if not, is that one of the reasons why we are discussing loss and damage? So that's a way that we could define loss and damage, a failure of adaptation or, and a failure of us to mitigate leads to loss and damage. And then uh, finally, this gap that is identified around non-economic loss and damage and an emerging debate between non-economic losses and non-economic losses and damages. And we have a few people in the audience here who can add on to that. Okay, so just then first consideration in terms of the policy context. So this point here relates to some of the points related, brought up in the gaps uh, by Lily just now. And that's, I would fully agree that there needs to be advancement in terms of getting a better understanding of governing structures, coordination, ways in which the multilateral and the UNFCCC is tackling loss and damage, right? So whether it's what comes out of the Glasgow Dialogue, uh, how you organize the Santiago network, or how the WIM is governed uh, and coordinated. I agree with all of those, they're important. I would say, however, though, uh, just commenting uh, on the slides that Lily just ha had previously, um, is that, for example, um, when we look at the WIM, do we look at the WIM per se, or do we look at it in relation to other mechanisms that exist? That exist? And actually, making changes to the WIM, what effect does that actually have on the practice we see, or the responses in practice, or communities on the ground. You know, there's like a massive disjoint between that focus. So one is a very much international relations focus, how we can understand the effectiveness of international regime, regimes and how they're working, and the financial flows. And then the other one is then turning towards the role of the national level uh, in loss and damage, which I think is an area that needs much more attention. So this I have here, I just put this up here because I was coming over to Denmark. Obviously, Denmark has just pledged financial support towards loss and damage. 
uh, uh, sort of is seen here. Uh, this is an article from The Guardian. So it's sort of De Denmark gets the ball rolling uh, at the UN ahead of ahead of protests around loss, loss and damage. So it was very well timed. But I think that we need to be looking at this in terms of um, not just um, how the national level is developing mechanisms or um, has uh, particular mechanisms within country to deal with loss and damage, but also then what these pledges or what this kind of financial pledge would mean in terms of international foreign policy or resource flows into international aid. So I think that what it raises is that, first of all, from research, we know that there is quite limited focus on the national level in terms of loss and damage. We have quite limited focus in terms of understanding what that means. And obviously also linked uh, to one of the gaps in science is what does it mean for Denmark, for example, to develop these kinds of national loss and damage networks, both nationally in terms of how it addresses the effects of climate change within Denmark, but also how it affects the way that deals with its sort of international role uh, on the international stage. So that's sort of my, my first point in relation to the report focusing on trying to get an understanding or trying to get this right at the top level um, but do we miss then focusing uh, on the national level and what the connection between the national and the local level is? So that's my uh, first consideration. And we can come back to these uh, again uh, in the panel debate uh, in a little while. All right, so second consideration. Uh, is around actions. And this is also an important part of the report to really try and hone in on understanding what actions are taking place and going on out, out there, so to speak. And we've also seen examples today from Francis' work in Northwest Ghana. Um, we've seen Lillian Patrick's work in Canada. So I agree with the assessment that there are gaps on research focusing on slow onsets. I agree that there is a limited research on non-economic losses. Uh, we've been doing a review recently, and I think we found sort of some 50 examples around something like that of what would be classified non-economic loss and damage. Obviously, from what we heard earlier, there are many non-economic losses and damages out there, but they're not being um, assessed. We're not very good at picking them up. We're not very good at measuring them. We're not very good at finding new methods and tools to be able to bring in those lived experiences international international policy. Um, so I would say that I agree with that, uh, all those points made in the report. What I would add to it though as well is that there is a, so there is a gap in terms of the everyday lived experiences and examples, so bringing those in. I think there's uh, gaps in terms of tensions between north, south in terms of loss and damage. Um, and I think that also um, we find that whatever uh, this, this example here shows, uh, and together with the climate change report, the IPCC report, show that even with effective adaptation, we will see losses and damage damages occurring. Um, I think also uh, one of the final points here on this slide um, is that uh, we also see, yes, so moving on to this slide here, gaps in research, in my last couple of minutes here. Um, it identifies that there are gaps in terms of non-economic loss and damage. Uh, this is uh, developed by uh, a map that we've used in the IPCC, but also uh, in a publication here where we're trying to just map onto a sort of vulnerability maps some examples of non-economic loss and damage that exist uh, in the literature. Um, just to demonstrate that there are overlaps uh, in terms of vulnerabilities and multiple non-economic losses and damages, uh, but also that these are global. So this is one of the tensions perhaps that we find uh, in that um, we have losses and damages both in the global south. The whole debate about loss and damage, big L and D, sits within a, a global south, global north framing. But what we're trying to do in the science of loss and damage is also identify where there are losses and damages in the global north. So a kind of 
global understanding of this. So whilst there are obviously greater vulnerabilities uh, in some parts of the world, for example, um, we see the Africa map here, there are greater vulnerabilities, um, but we also see that we see that there are non-economic losses and damages that have been identified in Scandinavia, for example, UK, France, and so on and so forth. So that brings in a new dimension into the debate uh, around loss and damage. Um, one of the debates that is coming forward now around uh, non-economic losses versus non-economic loss and damage um, is an interesting one. Uh, we'll come back to that in the debate uh, session or the panel session. But is it that we focus on definitions of non-economic loss in terms of sort of legal measurement of permanent losses, or do we need to consider damages uh, and harms that are re reversible in some systems? So, for example, um, we've been talking about you know particular ecosystems, for example, that are degraded and can revert. So those damages to those systems are not necessarily permanent. How do you deal with those then in terms of who's responsible, who's willing to pay for that and so on? Um, and I think that importantly that we need to connect to, uh, which Lily did also bring up, uh, the aspects of attribution and connecting what we understand by um, non-economic losses and damages to places where there are events that can be attributed to climate change. So this has implications then for discussions about who pays, who's responsible, what are the social drivers of vulnerability, and so on. So I guess I'm coming up to my final, final slide here now. So in terms of my concluding uh, comments here, um, just three points, around, firstly around policy that um, it's important to consider in disentangling the relationship between policy, development, institutions and interests at different scales and in relation to funding. So that relates to uh, work, for example, by Lisa Van Halla and others who are trying to, to disentangle this. And I think it relates to, you know, we can, we can set out what we need to do within the UNFCCC, we can set out what we need to do at the national level, but we need to look at the scalar interconnections between these, really to understand um, the, the political nature of this. And I think it links back to your final point, which is about depoliticizing. Is it actually possible to depoliticize? I, is there a value in studying or understanding the political here? Um, and I don't, I don't think we're gonna be able to get away from the political nature of this and ideas, interests, you know, and institutions, what's at stake. Okay, in terms of the second point, in terms of the action and the practice, um, I think that we've learned a lot from adaptation and development in DRR and so on um, to, as to what works and what doesn't work. And I think we need to draw on those lessons. I think people like Siri Erickson and others who have written quite recently about adaptation interventions and the failures of adaptation interventions. When we're thinking of practice of loss and damage, I think we need to learn lessons from that as well. So we're not creating a whole new, repro reproducing a new system and making similar mistakes that we may have made in development in the past. And then in terms of research, uh, just to wrap up that, and I think others have also identified this here, that we need development of methodologies, and whilst this is about lived experiences and not theory per se, I think that we also need to work on theorizing what this means uh, in new ways, uh, considering lived experiences and also evidence base to better enhance our methods and tools uh, around loss and damage. Obviously, just to finish off, there's obviously contestations and challenges throughout all of these points that I made above. Uh, and on that note, I say thank you very much. Look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Emily, very much. Um, I would like to invite you to uh, take a seat up there together with uh, Lily so that we can start 
establishing the panel for the discussion. And um, also Matthias Söderberg, who is coming there, who is uh, chief advisor in Dan Church 8 and um, work on, on climate change and development issues and has provided input to this uh, report that has just been. And while um, you think about the uh, interesting questions you would like to get answers to, I will just start by uh, uh, putting up one question. And but before, I would just like to hear whether uh, we have still Francis and Lily and Patrick with us. Hopefully we can get you on the screen so that, um, yes, there we have Lily and Kay. Francis and Hopefully, Patrick will also show up. So, so uh, thank you very much for still being around. I know the time is not um, <coughs> so uh, convenient in Canada right now, uh, but thanks for being with us. Uh, but uh, Matthias, I would just like to uh, raise a question to you um, in order to get you on board in the discussion, because we have just heard that um, we need novel solutions. We need to look elsewhere. And Emily said that perhaps we should look partly at the national level and forget a little bit about the international level. Um, not well, leaving it out altogether. But do you see any possibilities for looking elsewhere? Do you see new solutions in the horizon? For, because it is obvious from all this that we have to act very quickly. Um, yes, well, yeah, both uh, yes and no. <laughs> there are a lot of important experiences in the existing work uh, different organizations are doing. We are working uh, I'm working in, in, in a Danish development NGO. Uh, we are also a humanitarian NGO. Uh, we are addressing loss and damage on the ground right now. And, and we have certainly some experiences which are important. But loss and damage is a huge challenge. And we must acknowledge that uh, we don't know exactly how to deal with all of these, these challenges, especially when we talk about the existential, existential uh, loss, which, which and a non-economic uh, loss. and and uh, the, the also part of the slow uh, onset disasters, which are really difficult to handle with the instruments and the modalities we have today. So therefore, we need new uh, ways to work. And there, I think the best way forward is, is the international level where we can exchange experiences and where we can en also engage with people who have experience from the national level and the, and the ground, but where we also can ensure that we get the experiences from different parts of the world so that we can develop new ways of, of addressing uh, loss and damage. Okay, great, thanks. Collaboration internationally is still a good thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, please, um, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and then we will get a mic to you. I think we will take a couple of questions or three in to start off with. And please present yourself when you get the mic. So my name is uh, John Obo. I'm climate advisor with CARE Denmark. Um, and well, I guess there is an elephant in the room because uh, you haven't really talked about what is the, the big problem when it comes to deal with uh, loss and damage. And, and I think if you look at it from a sort of political perspective, <coughs> we have uh, a very tough resistance from the US in, in the global climate negotiations to to deal with loss and damage and we have uh, quite a support for the US position from the European countries. I mean they're sort of hiding behind uh, the US in these uh, negotiations. <coughs> so I mean I, I think it's a very very interesting report you've made and I, I look forward to, to uh, read it but I wonder if you have some some sort of uh, perspectives of uh, or this elephant in the room. I mean, how do we tackle that? Or should we? Should we try to to go around, work outside uh, uh, the US, and and solve the problem with support of, of some European countries, or or so? Yeah, that's sort of the question. Thanks, John. Another question here in the first round. Yes. You have to run <laughs> slowly, please. Yeah, we have a few questions here from the people joining us online. And um, one of them is asking, um, is writing, agree with Emily on focusing more on the national level. What role do you see that bilateral development cooperation can play in facilitating that? Okay, thank you. Then let's start with that and um, go to you. 
And here a little bit about um, yes, the elephant in the room. Uh, it's hard to avoid. Um, I would like to you f the three of you to to consider that, and then perhaps also go to the, uh, to our um, other presenters. And if you can think a little bit about uh, this, well, uh, it's obvious in in the. A case of Ghana to consider um, uh, bilateral aid or aid uh, the the whole aid industry. Um, so it would be nice to have your perspective on that, Francis. But let's start with the elephant in the room. Matthias, would you like to start out? Yes, the the it's a really really big elephant. Uh, it's <laughs> it's been there around since 1991, so it's it's uh, grown, uh, and um, I, I think the, the the elephant is actually focused on finance because this is the really the, the tricky part of this debate. I, I think, to be fair, I think all countries, all governments are quite concerned about loss and damage because it's, it's a threat. All, all governments, all, all countries, all people will have to face um, sooner or later. So it's, 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 um, it's, it's a challenge where we can unite. But when it comes to funding, it becomes really tricky because who is going to pay? Uh, we have... Uh, clear evidence from science that, that climate change is, is uh, man. Uh, we have created this problem uh, thr through emissions, so therefore it's also quite easy to point at those who are polluters and, and responsible. And this is where it becomes really, really tricky. And I don't know exactly how to deal with the, the elephant, but I, I think Denmark has done a good, uh, good uh, first move at least, because loss and damage finance is, is the key to, to dealing with this elephant. And and we need uh, to have the, that discussion more more a more constructive discussion about how to ensure the funding. So I, I hope more countries will fun follow Denmark, Scotland, and Wallonia, uh, who who are the ones who have been contributing so far, uh, plus a, a number of, of philanthropies. And I really hope that this can open up the the, the talks uh, on loss and damage finance, because we should remember that the UN climate talks they are always balanced. This is one of the the key word in, in, in uh, UN politics, that you need to balance the different interests. And, and for developing countries, loss and damage is one of the core interests. So there will only be progress if there is also some progress on loss and damage. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a huge elephant, I agree. Um, I also, I, I mean, it goes back to our, f our failure to mitigate basically, uh, and those, you know, responsibility, question of responsibility. So, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't really answer it because we haven't cracked it, and I think it opens up a whole other set uh, of discussions that sort of come under working group three, I think, uh, of the IPCC around, you know, how do we find development pathways that are fair, uh, and how do we hold accountable and redistribute and all of those big societal questions, right? I think what loss and damage represents is that we're at a, you know, a, a, we're at increasingly a sort of um, a tight and contentious space when it comes to climate change. And I think that partly what I was saying earlier about where change will come about is not to say that I think the national level will solve things, is to say that what we see bubbling up is civil society engagement, we see court cases, we see uh, alternatives that maybe in the past we saw come and go quite quickly. You know, we saw, we saw movements in the 1990s around rainforests and protecting rainforests and civil society and they came, kind of came and went. But I'm, I'm wondering if this kind of mobilization is, is not gonna go. So, and that's not to say that I have put all my hope in that. It's just to say what we observe. Um, I think finance is part of it, but I don't think it's just about finance, ultimately. I mean, I think finance unlocks many things, but I think there have to be political, uh, moral, uh, societal changes that come with it as well to be able to, to really both go into understanding the existential dimension of this, understanding uh, what it means for different groups in society, and what the difference is between the economic and the non-economic. So where we are very good at measuring the economic currently, so we can measure a disaster, for example, and we have insurance for that, 
and we can pin this, uh, you know, responsibility in ways and create compensation. We're we're really ill-equipped with the non-economic. You know, we don't know how to measure that. Those are the bits that, um, those are the bits that are, as Francis was saying, are visible, but we're not able to uh, tap tap onto that. So I'm sort of rambling on a bit here. Um, <laughs> lots of lots of really interesting points, and uh, that you you've made in relation to, you know, I guess who's responsible ultimately. So that brings me around. Thanks. Lily, could I just um, ask you, in relation to the elephant in the room, yeah. um, do you think that it is worthwhile to look at the elephant, or should we? No, no, I'm uh, Lily. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> not Emily. Lily, this time, um, should we look at the elephant, or should we leave it, take it out of the room, and get some new in ideas, new inspiration, and so on? Um, I mean, if we are in a situation of urgency and of substantial amounts of money, shouldn't we go elsewhere? Um, do you see any possibilities, or not possibilities, but, but uh, as a, do, uh, having uh, written this report, is it realistic to look at this elephant and keep looking at it and keep fighting about it? Well, I mean, you ask if, you know, as if we could go somewhere else, and I think that's part of the problem, is where else to go. Um, because we see across uh, sectors that are relevant in terms of loss and damage that there simply isn't the capacity. You know, in terms of humanitarian actors, already extremely strained. In terms of development approaches, there's only certain aspects of loss and damage that those are addressing, and that's also, you know, with certain limitations. So there's nowhere else to go. And I mean, I think when I say, you know, working to depoliticize, that's not because I think everything will be possible or as a desirable to depoliticize, because these things are, I mean, they're inherent disagreements divergences in positions that I don't think we should look away from. So I think work to depoliticize should be with those very much in the forefront and acknowledging those divergences and seeing how we can work through those with those divergences to find some areas that we can carve out of that and say, here we can move from this political level to perhaps a more technical level and try and solve that in this way, in certain areas at least. Okay, thanks. Francis, could I turn to you and uh, hear your views on, on uh, yeah, development cooperation? Do you see uh, uh, possibilities there? I think development cooperation is very, very important and essential if, uh, first of all, nations are to uh, come together and to push uh, for more proactive uh, climate action. Um, they can forge alliances and uh, that can really lead to uh, some substantial changes globally. At the same time, you can find um, these collaborations important as uh, countries can learn from each other about best practices. And uh, we really need to foster that so much. But also the danger lies in where um, one country dominates another so much. Uh, particularly when it has to do with funding and uh, if the ideas are going to be decided upon on how to approach uh, uh, climate action, um, whereas there is not enough consideration uh, of local views, then you see a lot of money being pushed out and not achieving anything at all. Um, so also at the national levels, you find that scientists uh, consider little views from local people and uh, tend to assume that populations are homogeneous, uh, whereas we really need to look at um, the real differences between different groups and uh, what their needs really are. So I think uh, this can also play out at a global level, where we need to really consider how this collaboration comes up and how they can together push for more uh, quicker uh, uh, action, because we are behind time. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Lilia and Patrick, uh, if Patrick is still with us. But uh, at least, Lilia, uh, could I ask you, um, in, in relation to this discussion, how do you see these experiences from the local uh, level? Uh, Francis just said that we need to acknowledge the diversity uh, and should be very uh, much aware of that. But uh, do, uh, how do you see it from, from uh, th that perspective, uh, the local perspective, uh, these international discussions? Uh, is the elephant uh, in the room uh, important from your perspective? 
Um, so first of all, I wanted just to say that Chief Patrick had to leave. He ran off to the discussion. As he said, um, in Canada, uh, 634 First Nations are meeting, um, 500 of them are present at this uh, Assembly of First Nations meeting on climate change. Each nation has very different needs. Each nation has very different capacities. It has different population. Um, it's struggling with other losses like language loss, um, food losses, and, and so on and so forth. So even within Canada, a distinction-based approach is very difficult. At the same time, we have a federal um, kind of climate where the nations have to compete against each other for funding, right? So even if we can't sort it out within this kind of kind of functional funded spaces, right? Like how can we then go scale that up at the global level? So there are uh, huge issues, of course, with that. But I just, uh, while I have this uh, space, I just wanted to say what uh, Chief Patrick said. Um, um, and he's happy to take any questions by email and he's really responsive. So as he said, we are running out of time, but we still have some time. So how do we motivate the mitigation to sl slow down the worsening effects and fund the transition and adaptation project, given that there is lag time and inertia, it's ga getting to go, it's going to get worse before it can get better. Common cause, our children and grandchildren, what would you do for them? Thank you, Lillian. Yes, do we have other questions? Yes, please. Hi everyone, my name is Guy Jackson from Lund University. I'm a postdoctoral researcher. So I had a couple of questions, but I'll just try to make the conversation go. Like, so I'll choose something slightly different. But I suppose um, just on like the complexity of the scale thing as well. So, you know, it's not international or national, but it's also historical future and, and current. So learning from DRR and development and things and everything is very reactive. So l I feel there's a risk of loss and damage just reacting because it's already happening, overcoming the capacity at the local levels. But we have to try and avoid that. So we need to really look at averting. And that is a very political question. It's about redistribution of resources of the o um, around the world. It's about reparations, these sorts of things. So I think even though some aspects can be technical, um, we still need to keep that politics, the broad scale politics, which is about sovereignty and people actually having the agency to dictate their lives, which is inherently linked to how people respond to climate change. So discussion point. Yes. It w it's on. Okay, I'm Anna Meyer from the Danish Red Cross and being a humanitarian actor, we respond to more and more disasters and we are a little bit up against the wall because it's just increasing. And like you said, Lily, there are not enough funds in the world. So what do we do? So you mentioned innovative financing and I would like to hear a little bit more. What does that imply? If you could elaborate what you think would be the best ways for innovative financing. Thank you. Other questions? While we are at it. Okay, then um, I'll turn. Sorry? Yes? Oh, yes. We have different audiences. Yes. Um, another question is if the G77 is united in the ask for L&D finance, are some major emitters in G77 only for it as long as they know someone else who will block it? Or uh, as long as they know someone else will block it? I don't know the technical uh, stuff, but I hope you understand. Yes. But I think, uh, Lily, could you uh, start out by uh, talking a little, little bit about this uh, point that um, things are political. <laughs> uh, so when you say de depoliticizing, you have hinted at it, you don't mean to stop the political talks, but, but uh, you want to change it not into a technical discussion, but to into something different. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it, that goes a bit back to what I said before, and then building on that from Guy's question, thank you for that. Um, I think one thing that's a challenge often when you're doing research in a field like this is that the point of departure from research, from the research side, is often based on a policy frame. And that can be very difficult because, as you say, it's in a way reactive. And I think this is also what Emily brought up in her presentation, which I think is so extremely relevant. Because if we are in a place where business as usual has brought us here, <laughs> 
and the thinking that and approaches that we have had to date have brought us here. And then we take our departure in many of those same practices and approaches, even though some of them have are, are very useful. I mean, it's not to just um, you know a blanket st statement. This is very nuanced. At the same time, though, you know we also need to think differently and and understand in, in new ways. And and I think the point that Emily had in her last slide about theory is also about this. Um, and that brings us to different approaches and, um, and, and, and basically if we're stepping outside of that predefined policy space and uh, thinking in different ways, then we're going to have different approaches. I mean, you brought up some, there are many thoughts on this. Yeah. And that could lead to a discussion of, of innovative finance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if you want to pick up on that, Lily, also? Or? I'll just uh, mention very briefly, I mean, this is an area, as as we've heard, I mean, it's it's based on the fact that we're seeing as a, such a high demand, um, and, and we heard from our um, colleague at the Red Cross, I mean, you know, up against a wall, that's the words that she used, and so that's the situation, and so it's basically a completely pragmatic approach to where is it that we can get funding to meet these growing needs that we're seeing right now, and we simply cannot cannot address. Um, and so some of the things that have been brought up as suggestions is that at the national level we can start as a levying um, as a you know taxes on um, on carbon emissions on uh, on flights we can start taxing large corporations so just to say these are some of the proposals that have been um, brought up and and many others so it's just simply non-traditional forms of finance not based on you know these voluntary contributions through development aid humanitarian assistance climate finance. Matthias, do you have anything on that? Yeah, um, on both that and, and also the political uh, challenge with the G77. But first, on innovative finance, the, the, the I think ma many parties, there, there is probably some kind of agreement that, that there is need for innovative finance. But as soon as we start to discuss exactly what kind of tax or what kind of solution, it will become much, much more complicated. But I really hope that, that uh, uh, there, there can be some progress on, on this field because the, the amount of money we need is so, so big. Um, we have, for example, a, an example from, from the uh, UN agreement about carbon trading, where every time there is some kind of carbon trading, there should also be some money allocated for adaptation finance uh, through the adaptation fund. Doesn't, it's not really a big success yet, but the idea to create some kind of international uh, uh, tax uh, or, or international fees which can contribute with funding would really be good to get this additional funds which are needed. About the G77, um, uh, what are the big polluters within G G77 saying about loss and damage? Well, so far they are very united uh, and, and uh, you could of course question what kind of interest there are and, and, and maybe this is just tactics and this is going back to the question about politics uh, because the loss and damage is is to a, a large extent a political political football in in this game in the UN and that makes it a little bit unfortunate uh, because there are people suffering on the ground so we, we really need for at least part of the debate discussions to try to see look for the solutions and and I would like to differ between the finance discussion and the technical solutions discussion because the finance discussion it will be politicized and it will be it's really really difficult to move away from that political uh, sphere but when we talk about the solutions and about the, the technical approaches how to deal with non-economic loss how to uh, help those who, who, who face slow onset disasters there the Santiago network is one of the important um, um, yeah, uh, elements in this discussion. The Santiago network, for those of you who do not know it, is the idea is to create a, a global network and, and, and to uh, address uh, find ways to address uh, loss and damage, avert and minimize as well, but but how to deal with, with the loss and damage. And this is where uh, not only governments, but also uh, humanitarian actors, uh, and other development actors, uh, other stakeholders who, who have some relevant experience can take part. And hopefully this will to not make it so political, because that's where the solutions will hopefully be found. 
Thank you. Uh, Lily, could I just uh, ask you, uh, in, in Canada, whether innovative uh, financing has been an issue uh, in the different discussions, or is it primarily a discussion between uh, the different nations and the state uh, in Canada, uh, and how, how to address uh, these issues? Because as we heard from Patrick, uh, it's obvious that the, the difficulties on the ground are huge. Uh, I think, uh, so in Canada, there is a lot of um, hopeful space in uh, First Nations and Indigenous leadership. Uh, a lot of the work, for example, in the, uh, in the Chief Patrick's community, uh, own source financing, right? So when you actually have your own money to reinvest in your community, instead of depending on colonial dollars, which are scarce. And as I said, there is a high competition. It's administratively burdensome. Some communities simply don't have even staff or capacity to apply for funding. So, and the federal government is really working hard to make that easier and so on and so forth. But um, there is really exciting um, work happening in the space of indigenous conservation and the finances and credits and so on and so forth. So I think uh, it's a very hopeful space to watch. Again, of course, as Lily said, are we using kind of the same mechanisms that got us into this problem to trying to solve these uh, issues? Of course, that's, that's the question uh, that remains. How do we value nature? Whose values count, right? Like this, that's, I think, another really important thing is that the values that indigenous peoples place on the land and non-human life forms and, and resources, what they're called in the Western world, are very different. So how do you value it accurately? How does that reflect and how, how do you reflect that in financing mechanisms? But definitely indigenous conservation areas, that's something to really watch uh, what's happening there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are running out of time. And I don't see any additional questions. So I would just like uh, to ask you, Francis, whether you have any comments to this discussion of yeah, C7, uh, G77 and all uh, the financing issue. Well, uh, I have not much to say, but I just like to say that uh, it's important that uh, many young, more young scholars from um, uh, particularly poorer nations and uh, 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 I mean uh, have the opportunity to be educated about some of these things that are happening um, and how uh, for example the carbon market and how uh, some of the um, uh, challenges how they might affect them in the future and how they need to prepare themselves to also participate more actively and more beneficially. Um, there is little action in some of these countries, particularly in Africa, that we see big climate change documents sitting at the national level and very little mainstreaming at the local level. So uh, I, I think that uh, much more education on climate change uh, will really help the world move forward. Thanks a lot. Education is always important. Yes, Emily, you yeah. get the last. Uh, yeah, I think um, from all of this, I see it as sort of like a bricolage of ways to tackle loss and damage. It's coming at all different scales in many different ways. And I think that uh, I agree the, the, the funding that Denmark has given now, the show of that is uh, some kind of leadership. But we would love to also then see where this funding goes and what, what, it, what it does to be able to understand the effectiveness of the financial aspects. Um, but I think at the same time, um, there will be consequences from financial flows and compensation and what is to come. So we just have to be aware of that and that many things will happen at many different levels, like a bricolage, all contributing to, to different elements. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, uh, uh, Matthias. Thank you, Lily. Thank you very much, Lily, for being awake at this hour of day. And thank you very much, Francis. And pass on our greetings to, to Patrick also uh, for his uh, participation. So we end here. And thank you very much for the questions.